woman in the Bible. Three among many great women in the Bible. But these three all are to be found in um, First and Second Kings. And you can go to First Kings chapter 17 to begin with. The first one that we'll look at, she is found during the ministry of the prophet Elijah. And the next two, and I guess because Elisha had a double portion of the spirit, he got two great women um, mm -hmm. show up under his uh, administration, so to speak, during his time, Elisha. Elisha follows Elijah in terms of the prophets. And the way to keep it straight is J comes before S. So Elijah came along, and then the prophet that, as he gets to the end of his ministry, that he trains to take over and then does take over is Elisha. And two of the great, great prophets in, in God's word. Um, you stay, did I tell you 1 Kings 17? Okay. 1 Kings 17, you stay there, and I'm going to, before we read that record, I'm going to read you a verse from James chapter 5. Uh, you don't have to turn there. James chapter 5 about Elijah and one of the great accomplishments of his ministry and how it's a great example for us today. In James 5, in verse 16, in the latter part of that verse, it says that the effectual, work, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The effectual. Effectual means it brings about the desired results. You know, you don't want those prayers that just bring about some kind of results. You want the desired results. And the effectual, fervent prayer. Mm -hmm. What kind of prayer? Fervent. 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 Prayer is something that <clears throat> if it's going to bring about effectual results, it needs to be fervent. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to be like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, where your you know, prayer was so fervent that you sweated like blood. Um, it just means that you're focused. It's really focused. It's not, you know, a matter of how long. It's not a matter of, you know, torturing yourself while you're praying. I think of the simplicity of George Mueller's prayers and the example that he was, and just these very short, simple, powerful prayers. But he was focused. He believed. He was focused with believing. And that fervent prayer is a prayer of believing. Hmm. And the effectual fervent prayer, what is, where was I? Verse 16. Of a righteous man avails much. Then it goes on to say, Elias, it says, which is Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. He was a guy like us. Sometimes we read the people about the people in the Bible, and there can be a tendency to, to put them way up there on a pedestal that they are so far above us that it's like there's something in a different category. They're like super people, okay? <laughs> But he was a man subject to like passions. He was, you know, he he had his days where he was in a bad mood. He had his days where he didn't feel good, you know? He didn't feel good. Maybe for no particular reason. He just like, you know, felt yuck that day. And he had his days where he got discouraged even when you read about his life. And there were times where people did stuff that, that really made him angry. He was a man subject to like passions as we are. He had the same kind of emotions, the same kind of feelings, the same kind of experiences in, <clears throat> excuse me, in life that we go through. And yet, this man, it says, he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Now, this wasn't like Elijah just, you know, liked going to the beach and he, you know, didn't want it to ever rain because he just wanted to be at the beach. Or that he was a painter and he, you know, wanted to not have it ever rain so he could get more houses done. He 
<clears throat> prayed for it not to rain for the space of three years and six months because God told him to do that. Why did God tell him to do that? Because <clears throat> Israel had gotten so far out there and God had done so much to try to call them back. And at this time, they had a king over them that was so bad, and his wife was even worse. Believe it or not, Jezebel. You ever hear that Jezebel? Well, that's mm -hmm. where that was. That's where it comes from. That's she's the first Jezebel, and she was like killing prophets, like she was getting bounty for them. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, she was killing prophets like somebody was paying her to do it. Wouldn't she kill five hundred at one time? Is that, mm -hmm. Do you remember that Omri? Anybody remember that one? Yeah, she. I went, remember. I think it's five hundred. If I remember correctly, on one day she has this five hundred prophets killed out, killed at one time. So, you know, God's trying to get through to them. God's trying to make a point here, and <laughs> He tells Elijah, "You pray for it to not rain, and I'll tell you when you can pray for it to rain." And three and a half years later is when it again. He's told to do that, to pray. Wonderful record, wonderful record. You have to agree that we won't get into that tonight. Sometime if you haven't read it, it's a fun record to read. I like the part where like God tells him to pray and he prays for it to rain again. And he tells his servant to go out there and go look for the rain. And the servant comes back and says, there is a cloud about this big out there. Okay, that's all that's there in the sky. A cloud about the size of a man's hand is all that's out there. And Elijah said, oh, it's in there. <laughs> and sure enough, man, it just, it, the heavens open up. <laughs> well, <clears throat> 1 Kings 17, we're not going to get into all of that, but we are going to get to what happens when it doesn't rain. What happens when it doesn't rain to the crops? They die. They die. They die. You don't have to have been on the farm to know that. You know that if it doesn't rain, that's not a good thing for things that are trying to grow. And if you don't have food, if you don't have crops, you have no food, and pretty soon people are going to get pretty hungry, right? Mm -hmm. Well, how do you take care of Elijah? You know, how do you take care of Elijah? And how do you take care of other people that haven't fallen into this idolatry? You know, God figures out a way. Elijah is one that he takes care of, and there's a wonderful woman that loves God, believes God, and, and loves his, his people, and his man of God, Elijah, and she's taken care of. And that's what we're going to look at. We'll pick it up in verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab. Ahab is that bad king I was talking about. As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Neither dew nor rain until he says. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This is God talking to Elijah, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. So there's his water. God tells him to go by this brook, and that brook won't dry up. While God, and so long as God tells him to be there, and he'll be able to get water there. And I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So God's plan for Elijah is that he's going to have the ravens come and, and bring him food. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. You know, now Elijah could either believe this or, or not believe it. You know, birds are going to bring me food. No, that's just crazy. You know, I, I better start hunting around and, and laying up some, you know, stuff in store. But then he would have run out real quick because his supply was limited. God could make sure that he was taken care of. And it doesn't matter how silly it sounds or how crazy an idea, nor whatever it takes, God will take care of his people as they trust him. Mm -hmm. There's the takeaway for us, okay? You may not have ravens come and feed you. If Leah hears this, she'll be thinking of the Baltimore ones. <laughs> She'd like them to show up at her doorstep. <laughs> 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 
You may not have ravens come and feed you, but whatever it takes, God will take care of his people. This is a famine, you know. I still remember like the famine in Ethiopia, mainly because there was some rock concert to help those guys out. Um, but a famine, you know, that gets real serious real quick. That gets real serious real quick. We think that sometimes we go through tough times and we hear in our country about recessions and economic downturns and, you know, all these terrible We've never gone through anything like this. You know, the worst thing still to this day in the history of our country that we ever went through was the Great Depression. And that was bad, and I'm not trying to minimize that. But at the height of the Great Depression, do you know how many people were out of work? 25% of the population. Now, that's a lot of people. Nevertheless, we're still saying 75% of the people never lost their jobs. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll guarantee you, in this famine, it was more than 25% of the people that were a little bit hungry. And there were not even any bread lines for these guys to be standing in mm -hmm. because there was no bread, period. Mm -hmm. And yet, God took care of his people. God took care of his people then. God will do it today, whatever it takes. And the thing that we have to always stay focused on is God will supply. God will supply. He did it here for Elijah. He had to have some ravens. That's his first plan, and then he changes it after a while. So he went, verse 5, and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. So here they are, don't know where the ravens are finding it, but they're bringing him bread and flesh. And, you know, flesh doesn't mean like, you know, some, you know, some cow, I don't know, something. I can't imagine that it's anything else. <laughs> and it came to pass after a while, verse 7, that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And Elijah said, well, now I'm done for. You know, God, that wasn't much of a plan. It was okay while it lasted, but not, you didn't think very, didn't really think this thing through, God, because no rain, that brook dried up. Now what? No. He knew that if God had taken care of him that way, when that supply right. ended, God would have to have something else. Right. And he didn't worry about it. You know, he could have. I'm sure like, after a while, you know, maybe the first day that brook was a nice, like, wide brook, you know, running through. And after a few weeks, it's getting, you know, you know you've seen things dry up, right? It starts to get to be, it's like a little brook over at Hoops Park, you know, about on a hot summer. It gets down to, you can cross that real easy. You know, you can step on those stones, no problem, and get across. He could start to think, what am I going to do? But he doesn't. He just trusts that God will have it for him. And verse 8, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So God tells Elijah, go there, go to this place, and I've commanded a widow woman to take care of you there. Okay? That's what God tells him. You know what? When he gets there, it's not going to, you would expect that, like, Hi, I, you know, if God told me that, I'd show up at her door and say, Hi, I'm the guy that God told you to take care of. But that's not the way it plays out. So he arose and went there. When he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, sure, you're, you're that prophet. God told me you were coming. I've got it all ready for you. <laughs> no. <laughs> she says, verse 12, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. <laughs> Now, if I 
went to this woman who I thought, God, didn't you, I, I thought you told me this you were going to tell this woman to have food for me. But I get there and she's saying, I never heard such a thing. I've got just enough for me and my son to have one last meal. We're going to eat it and then we're going to die. Now, that's her plan. That's kind of a sad plan. And personally, I would feel like really awkward saying, well, that's nice, but rather than you and your son having that last meal, you should give it to me. <laughs> 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 but that's what God has told him that's going to happen. And that's what he tells her. Of all Verse 13. And Elijah said unto her, what? Fear, Fear not. not. Fear not. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Don't be shook. Don't look at as bleak as the situation looks. Don't look at the circumstance. Fear not. Go and do as thou hast said. You want to go make your meal? You go ahead and do that. But make me thereof a little cake first. Before you do that, I want you to make me a cake first. And bring it unto me. And after, make for thee and for thy son. Okay. And he's just telling her, as he's gotten the information, what to tell him. You know, this is not trying to play games with her. He doesn't say, you know, okay, well, don't, you know, that's not the plan. Okay, God's going to take care of us, and we're going to have it. And this, he just tells her, okay, I just, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you as far as how little you have, but I know that it's right for you to first make something for me. And she could say to him, buzz off, buddy. Okay. I've got one last meal here, but she has enough respect for him as a man of God. And ultimately meaning she has enough love and respect for God that she's going to do this. Verse 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. I love that verse. I cannot tell you how many times in life I have that verse has been, you know, I never put it on my wall, actually. I didn't need to. It was like, uh, you know, always before my eyes. It was, it was something I just lived on and to some extent still do, you know, just day after day where the famine's not over. I'm, a famine's there. Famine's not over. I don't know what to say, except I know that the meal will not run out, the oil will not fail until it does. That somehow God is going to keep me going. Somehow God's going to keep taking care of me. And I may not see you know, thousands of dollars in the bank, but I don't need to. That's not my sufficiency. My sufficiency is God, mm -hmm. and he yeah. will see me through. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's doing here for these guys. And verse 15, she went, what a wonderful woman. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he in her house did eat, how long? Many, many days. Many days. Until that rain came. God took care of them. She believed the word that was given to her from the man of God. She trusted God. She trusted that God would take care of them. Elijah trusted that God would take care of them. And he just did. He took care of them that whole time. And the barrel of meal wasted not, verse 16, Neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of what? The Lord, 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 which he spake by Elijah. According to the word of the Lord, we have words from the Lord. God says that he will never fail us. God says that, you know, my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God says that he is able to to you know, bless us exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. There are all these wonderful promises that we can claim. These are the words of the Lord to us. God's promise to us is every bit as sure, it is more sure than the promise that was to that woman. 
because we are his children. Verse 17. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. Well, that's as sick as he can get, isn't it? His sickness was so bad that he died. Okay. His sickness was so bad that the boy dies. And she, the woman, said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? What did you come here for? You know, did we do something wrong that you came here so that my kid would die? For no reason. He just seems to up and have died. And he said unto her, Give me thy son. He stays calm. He knows that God's, this is not the will of God. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. <clears throat> Elijah stand with them. And he takes him up and lays him in his bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O oh, Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourned by slaying her son? And God, of course, and had that was not the will of God, and God's revelation is for him to, to minister healing and to restore the life of the boy. And he stretched himself on the upon the child three times, and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again, his breath life, his soul life, breath life. Let him come back to life. And the Lord did what? Heard. heard. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came in again, into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, see, my son, he's okay. He's all right. I didn't do a bad thing here. I, he died. It wasn't God's will that he died. God didn't kill him. He died. But because I was here and because I believed God, I ministered healing and brought him back to life. And the woman said to Elijah, I like this, now by this I know that thou art a man of God. <laughs> oh, for the past three, three and a half years, that, that didn't give you a clue here. You, you didn't know when that meal never ran out, the oil never failed, and I was a man of God. By this I know that you're a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in thy mouth is true. <laughs> it's, we laugh, I laugh at the, at the poor woman, but sometimes, many times, I'm just as dense or, or more so. You know, I can see God do great things time and again, and yet sometimes when the need's there, it's like, you know, it's just not as quick to, to remember that God is faithful. As I should be. And then when I see God come through again, it's like, man, I, I knew it all along. <laughs> well, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 4. And we'll see what, a couple of other great records of great women that trusted God. The first one's going to remind you a lot of the record that we just read. Very interesting how many of the records that happened in the ministry of Elisha are similar to the uh, ministry of Elijah. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Mm -hmm. This woman, her husband dies, and she is a widow. And in that culture, that time, that was even harder than it is now. Mm -hmm. Not that someone's grief today is any less, but in terms of their opportunity and what, what their plight was, it was much worse. It would be hard for a woman who had a couple of sons, you know, to take care of or whatever today. But she could go out there and get some kind of a job and there'd be some kind of help for her. This woman has a widow in that time. There was nothing. There was nothing. If she didn't have a relative that could bail her out, 
then she was really in big trouble. And that's why she comes to Elisha and saying, hey, my husband was, he was one of the sons of the prophets. That was like a leadership training program. And you know that he was a good guy, a guy that really loved God. And now he's dead. And I have no way of paying the bills. And the guy who I owe money to, he wants to take my two boys as servants, you know, slaves, to work off that debt. And they're my two kids, and I got nothing else. You know, Elijah, Elijah said unto her, What shall I do for thee? What can I do to help? Tell me, what hast thou in thine house? What do you have in your house? Let's, let's see what we got to work with. And I like this, too, because she doesn't have a lot to work with. But God can work with whatever you got to work with. You know, whether you've got great ability or little ability, whether you have lots of resources or little resources, whatever you've got, God can work with you to, to take care of the need. And that's what he does here. And she said, Thine handmaid hath nothing in my house, not a thing, not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. What a hey, that worked pretty well for Elijah. Maybe Elijah might even have told him about it. Revelation, though, of course, you can't, it's always different in every circumstance. It's similar here, but not the same. She has a pot of oil. That's what she has to work with. Then he said, Go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. Okay, you got a pot of oil? Go to all your neighbors and borrow all the pots and pans and buckets and jugs that you can find and bring them to your house. Okay. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. Shut the door. Don't let anybody see this. They'll all want to do it. And shall pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. Okay. She's got how many pots full of oil? One. One. And I'm, I'm picturing that I don't think this is really like a pot, you know, the size of this room. I think she's got a pot. Okay. She's got a pot of oil. And he tells her, get every container you can get and start filling them. Now, if I've got a pot this big, how many pots should I be able to fill? One the same size or a couple smaller, but that'd be about it, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not the plan. She's supposed to gather every, as many as she can get her hands on and start filling. And when you finish filling them all, there's still going to be more left over. That's the plan. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Reminds you of like loaves and fishes. Mm -hmm. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons. And brought the vessel to her and poured out. She poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil did what? Say it was still there. It was still there. Then she came and told the man of God, said, I got a house full of pots of oil now. And he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt. And live thou and thy children of the rest. So there she is. She goes and she starts selling this oil. You know, she opens up her little oil stand, <laughs> her little oil business. You know, Ma's Oil, come and get it. And she starts selling this stuff. And she's got enough to pay off all her debt. And enough money left over from the sale. And enough oil left beside that. That she can continue to live on the rest without having to get into debt again. <laughs> See, now, well... Is that going to be the plan, if, you know, <laughs> we should all, you know, get a pot of oil, you know, Crisco, olive oil, whatever you got, and just start and selling it? No. The specifics will be as different as there are different people and times and situations. But the constant is that God will take care of us. And he will give specific information. We heard in manifestations this evening. God talking about how he would give information, how he would direct, how he would work with us. God can do that. God promises that he can do that. That's in his word. We don't need specific revelation to know that part. God tells us that he will talk to us. He will guide us. He will direct us. Jesus said before he left, it's 
as sad as you guys are that I'm going, it's better for you that I'm going than if I stay. Because if I go, then the Father will send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, which is the guide. Okay, And it shall direct you. It shall guide you into everything you need to know. God will do that. He will direct us so that whatever we need to do in a circumstance, he'll show them. He won't keep it a secret. Verse 8. New story. And third woman here. And it fell on the day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman. This one's identified as being a great woman. And she constrained him to eat bread. Constrained. We talked about that last week, right? Twisted his arm, you know. Oh, you gotta come on, you gotta come, you gotta come. You know. So she she twists his arm, she constrains him, she just continues to implore him to come in and, and have some food with him, with her. And so it was that as often as he passed by, he turned in thither, turned in thither to eat bread. Whenever he's on his travels, he passed that house, and he'd always stop there, and he'd always come and and have a meal there with them. They got to really know each other. And they were blessed by his presence. And he was blessed with the way that they cared for him and took care of him. And there was just this wonderful, loving relationship there between this family and Elisha. And she said unto her husband, verse 9, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passes by us continually. After getting to know him a while, she recognizes that this is a holy man of God. This is a, a, a man of God, a prophet. She just invited him in out of the goodness of her heart. He could have been, you know, a robber. She didn't know him. He was just some guy passing by. And that is the hospitality of the East, that they would do that. But after getting to know him, she recognizes that this is a man of God. So she says to her husband, verse 10, let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall. Let's say I'm on a little room here. Okay, let's make a little a little room for him. And let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. Not a whole real fancy thing, but a nice little place. Got a little bed there, a little table to you know, write on, a little candle to see while he's writing and reading his stuff. And it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. You know, we'll make this nice little place for him to stay. I'm sure he's got like a long journey. And then besides having a meal, he can spend the night. It'll be really nice. <laughs> and it fell on the day, verse 11, that he came thither and turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call the Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. Now a Shunammite, okay, is she an Israelite? No, no. Jesus makes a real point of this. If you remember the record in the Gospels, you know, there are lots of hungry widows out of Israel at the time. But it wasn't any of them that God had taken care of. It was this Shunammite woman. Why? Because what does God respect? A person, who they are, or where their heart's at and what they believe? Right. They're believing. Yeah, they're believing in their heart. He doesn't respect, you know, you know, this person because they're of this lineage or this background or no. This was a Shunammite. And she was outside the fold. She wasn't one that had all the promises given to her that the Israelites did. But the Israelites, what were they doing at this time? Were they making nice little houses for men of God because they knew they were men of God? No. no, they were making nice little groves out in their backyards for the idols, for all the false gods. They were worshiping all the other gods. That's what they were doing. So they weren't getting taken care of. This wonderful Shunammite woman, she respects God and this man of God and takes care of him. So he says, I want to do something for her. Bring her in. And when he called her, she stood before him. Verse 13. And he said unto him, Say now unto her, so Elisha says to his to Gehazi, he works through Gehazi a lot, I'm not quite sure why. Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. You've taken 
such good care of us. He'd gone through all this trouble to take care of us. What is to be done for thee? We'd like to do something to, to repay your kindness. Wouldst thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? Should I put in a good word for with you, for you, with you know people of importance? And she answered, "I dwell among mine own people." She said, oh no, you know I don't. I'm not looking to go on, you know, into some king's court or, you know, be elevated to some big position. I'm, I'm happy with my people. I'm happy where I'm at. And he said, "What then is to be done for her?" You know, there's a real principle here that she did this thing for him, but boy, he looked to, to repay the favor. You know, I was taught that whenever somebody does something to bless you, that you look for a way, and especially, especially when somebody does something to bless someone who's given the, the responsibility of taking care of God's people, it's incumbent upon them to find some way to bless them back. And that's how Elisha feels him. And he says to her, what's to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, verily, she hath no child. And her husband's old. You know, he knows that she would like a kid. And her husband, he's old. And doesn't look like normally that, you know, that's going to happen there. And he called, and he said, call her. And when he called her, she stood in the door. And he said, Elisha says to her, about this season, according to the time of life, in other words, about nine months from now, that you know, according to the season, according to the time of life, like in nine months from now, thou shalt embrace the sun. You know, next time you husband, you and your husband get together, something's going to come with it. In about nine <laughs> months, you're going to have a kid. And she said, Nay, my lord, the man of God, did not lie into thy handmaid. <laughs> oh, who are you kidding? She's saying, you know. I mean, he's a nice guy, but have you seen him? <laughs> you know, he's getting old there. You know, don't lie to me. That, nothing's going to happen here. But nonetheless, that's the promise that she must have gotten around to believe in the man of God. As verse 17 says, the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her according to the time of life. So it was pretty clear to her that this was an answer to, to prayer. That this was God's blessing on her life that she receives the son. And that would be wonderful right there. We just closed the book, right? Mm -hmm. But there's more to the story. And when the child was grown, it fell on the day that he went out to his father to the reapers. The kid gets older now, a little bit older. And he's out there working in the field one day, a nice hot day. And he said unto his father, my head, my head. You know, <clears throat> it's believed that this kid was just sunstroke, that the sun just got to him here. And he said to a lad, carry him to his mother. You know, this is not just like, I've got a head. This is like serious. And he has to be carried to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her her knees till noon, and then what? Die. Die. You know, again, there's similarities to kind of what we had seen. You know, here was, just like Elijah, he had been blessed by this woman and her son, and then the son dies. Here with Elisha, here's his family. They have this son because of his, his blessing them in return for their kindness to him. And now this boy dies. And just as it wasn't the will of God for the first one to die, it wasn't the will of God for this boy to die, but, you know, it's going to take some doing to fix this. Verse 21. And she went up, and what did she do? Laid, Laid him on the bed, bed of the man of God, and shut the door upon him and went out. I'm sure he had his own room. Okay, I'm sure he had his own room. Why did she lay him on the bed of the man of God? Because that's where her believing was. Immediately her thoughts turn to the man of God. Immediately her thoughts turn to God doing something to fix the situation. To God taking care of this. And she lays him on the bed of the man of God. Basically putting him right then in the hands of God. 
And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. I got to go to the man of God. I got to go quick. And he said, Why? Wherefore wert thou going to, to him today? It's neither new moon nor Sabbath. He said, he doesn't know the kid's dead. Do you get this? Yeah. He doesn't know that the kid's dead, and she is not telling him. Hmm. He doesn't know he's dead, and he's wondering, why don't you want to go to the man of God? Well, she's not going because it is a religious day. She's not going for anything except she's looking for help. And she knows the man of God is the one that's going to be able to help her. And she never tells the husband in fact, when he asked her, what does she say? It shall be well. It shall be well. Man, this woman is famous for that confession. It shall be well. She confesses, it shall be well. Does the situation look like it shall be well? No. Her son is dead. That's the circumstance. That is the reality of the situation. My kid is dead. And she doesn't say to the husband, this is horrible. Our son is dead. She's not, she is not even visibly upset because he doesn't say what's wrong. He thinks she wants to go to the man of God because it's some religious deal that he doesn't know about. She never speaks the negative to people that can't do anything to fix it. And man, if that's one that you, you want to take away, they're Get that. Get that principle. She doesn't speak the negative. She doesn't confess it to herself. She doesn't say he's dead. She doesn't say all is lost. And she doesn't go whining and complaining. A couple other adjectives I decided not to use. She doesn't go whining and complaining to everybody else that can do nothing except cry with her and make her even more bitter and make her even more negative. That doesn't help. That doesn't help. She doesn't, she has a choice here. I'll say it, she can piss and moan or she can confess the positive and believe God to get the deliverance. And she decides that in this situation, it would behoove her to confess the positive and get the deliverance than whatever satisfaction she might emotionally gain from just ranting and raving and crying and whining and wanting everybody to feed that. That doesn't help. But confessing the positive and staying locked in on that, that's going to make all the difference. This is the woman that Jesus holds up as an example of believing. He picks three people as examples of believing, and this is one of them, this great woman, because she says, it shall be well. Then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. You whip that thing and get there as fast as you go, can go, and don't stop unless I tell you. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her. And say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? He sees she, you see a wagon coming in, you know, the trail of dust, and they're just going a mile a minute here. You know something's up. And Elijah says, Go, Elijah says, Gehazi, go find out what's going on. And Gehazi asks her, Are you okay? Is your husband okay? Is your boy okay? And what does she say? It is well. It is well. It is well. She again just confesses the positive. She's locked into it. And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away. She grabs him, grabs him. She is now, she's with somebody that she knows can help. There she'll make the need known. And she shows him how desperate she is. And the man of God said, so Gehazi let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. She is troubled to the very soul. And the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. God, he didn't know. He didn't know what was going on. God didn't give him revelation on this yet. 
God hadn't told him. Why? I don't know. God hadn't told him. Then she said, did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say do not deceive me? Didn't I say no that if, you know, that's bigger than, than I ever could dream for. Don't, don't, don't kid me. You know, I didn't, that was more my, than my heart could even desire. And here I now I have him and he's dead. Then he said to Gehazi, gird up thy loins and take my staff in thine hand and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not again. And lay my staff upon the face of the child. He tells Gehazi, you go in there, do this, and the kid will be okay. okay. And I can think of another time when he tells Gehazi to go talk to, take care of, of, of Naaman the leper. And Naaman won't have it, and that's the end of that until he comes around. But that's not the way this one plays out because there's some concern and feeling for this woman. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. No, she said, ah, no deal. you got to come. I'm not leaving you. You need to take care of this. And what does he do? And he arose and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore, he went again to meet him and told him, saying, the child's not awake. It didn't happen. Why? What's the believing in the mother? The believing in the mother is in mm -hmm. the man of God, and that's where her believing's at, and that's it. And God cares enough and loves enough that he'll take care of that. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain. Just him and the kid, now he's taken over, and it's his believing in the situation. And it's just him and the kid, and he's going to take care of this. And he prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child. That's, again, similar, huh? And put his mouth upon his mouth, and his eyes upon his eyes. Why did he do this? Because that's going to, no, because it's the revelation. This is what God's telling him to do in that situation. And his hands upon his hands, and he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. He starts to, to become warm. The body becomes warm, but the kid is not really brought back yet. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro, just pacing, pacing, asking God what to do next. And went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened mm. his eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> every time I sneeze and somebody says, are you coming down with the cold? Everyone grace just did. I just said, nope, I'm alive. <laughs> yeah. Proved that he was alive. That's what I think. Mm. I'm not buying all the other stuff. And he called Gehazi and said, call the Shunammite. So he called her. And when she was coming unto him, he said, take up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground, showing great respect, and took up her son and went out. And that's the end of that one. Mm -hmm. Great women, great believing, great learning for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you, God, that you are the same God that we read about there. That you are faithful to what you have promised and that we can trust you, we can trust your word, and you will always be there for us. We thank you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.